Welcome to the PR Maven podcast, a podcast all about growing your network and building your brand through traditional and digital networking techniques. I'm Nancy Marshall, the PR Maven and CEO of Marshall Communications. I've been strengthening brands through PR for over 35 years, and now I'm celebrating the success of executives, influencers, business owners, and entrepreneurs from all around the world, all of whom have cultivated their brands and broadened their networks through traditional and digital networking methods. Each week, I interview one of these interesting and influential individuals and provide an opportunity for you, the PR Maven Nation, to gain insights from their strategies and stories. So stay tuned for this week's episode, and thanks for listening. Hello, PR Maven Nation. Welcome to the PR Maven podcast, episode number 198. We're almost up to 200. Presented by Marshall Communications, creator of the Marshall Plan 65-step strategic process. For those of you who are new to the show, I'm Nancy Marshall, the PR Maven and CEO of Marshall Communications. Welcome. And with me today, my guest is Amber Lampke, co-founder and CEO of Main Grains. Welcome to the PR Maven podcast, Hi, Amber. Hi, Nancy. Thanks for having me. It's really nice to have you here. Yeah, wonderful to be here. So, Amber is a co-founder and CEO of Main Grains Incorporated, a grist mill housed in a repurposed jailhouse, which has spurred the revival of a grain production economy in central Maine. A driving force behind Maine's sustainable foods movement, she has been a leader in bringing economic vitality back to Skowhegan, Maine, by reviving the region's grain growing and processing industry. She was also the founding director of the Maine Grain Alliance, a nonprofit geared toward preserving regional grain traditions from earth to table. Her efforts through the Maine Grain Alliance have generated a broader understanding and appreciation of the nutritional and economic value of heritage grains and oats, as well as their exceptional flavor. The Alliance's Needing Conference, co-founded by Amber, now draws thousands of attendees from throughout North America each year and has spawned similar conferences across the country. And I think maybe around the world, but we'll talk about mm-hmm. that. <laughs> Amber, congratulations on 10 years of Maine Grains, and I actually feel a part of that too because we worked together 10 years ago. Yes, yes. <laughs> so, doesn't seem like we're old enough. (laughs) (laughs) Time flies. (laughs) Tell me about Maine Grains and why you started a grist mill in the first place. Boy, time does fly. And I remember working with you in the early (laughs) stages as we launched our business. Um, We started Maine Grains because I was doing some volunteerism in my community around local food and helping our farmers market grow. Uh, we realized that grains were really missing from local food discussions and from farmers markets, and we wondered why. And so a grassroots group of us in Skowhegan put together the first conversations in Maine that would talk about, um, could we grow grains in Maine? And um, why weren't we growing grains in Maine? And that conversation was called the Needing Conference, K-N-E-A-D, started in 2007. Uh, We realized that the first needing conference that one of the missing pieces in the state was just the infrastructure for cleaning and processing and de-hulling the grains we were growing and um, figured that if we could solve that, then we would jumpstart a grain economy in Maine. Well, this all resonates with me. I don't know if you knew that I grew up like baking bread in the 4-H. Uh-huh. <laughs> and that was one of my hobbies that um, I, it, it helps me get out all of my frustration, anger, and anxiety. And I had two older brothers that were like always punching me in the arm. Uh-huh. So the way I could get back was by making bread and then I would put their 
<laughs> their eyes and their nose and their mouth and then punch it. <laughs> and it turned out to be really great. Therapeutic. Bread. <laughs> Therapeutic and great bread. I actually won the Connecticut State Bread Baking Championship. No kidding. I did not know that about you. I guess I've you, never Nancy. told you. Yeah. No. Yeah. So I haven't really been baking bread recently, but I've always been very um, interested and inspired. And the whole idea of the kneading conference is, really resonates with me. Great. Well, I think baking bread is fundamental to um, a lot of our routines. And we certainly saw that through COVID. Yeah. Uh, so a lot of people who were home cooped up, uh, homeschooling, whatever folks uh, fi found themselves doing at home, they found themselves baking bread. And so that's that's been a real moment for grains. You had a real baking. surge in interest and in sales because of COVID, didn't you? We did, we did. You know, I, I think we can get more into it, yeah. but uh, uh, at the same time that toilet paper ran out yeah. on the grocery store shelves, so did flour. Right. And we were fortunate to have an online sales platform, which you helped us start uh, yeah. many years ago and uh, people found us online. So at the same time that some of our wholesale accounts had to slow down for a while, our retail sales online just went through the roof. Yeah, well, I'm really glad that, you know, there are some silver linings that came out of COVID. Mm -hmm. I know it was a really difficult time for many people, but I think uh, for a lot of people being home uh, inspired them to do some, some things that they normally wouldn't have time to do because mm, they're out of, out of the home. So yeah. you've had great success using a combination of public relations and personal branding techniques over the 10 years, combining media relations with speaking engagements and what I'd call thought leadership. Tell us if that has been a deliberate part of your strategy or if these kind of things come to you naturally. That's a great question. <laughs> Probably the hardest question, I think. Uh, uh, you know, my background is as a speech language pathologist. I had another life before grains. And so communication has always been very important to me and understanding um, how people communicate, uh, how people understand uh, what we're saying or not saying. Uh, body language is important. So that was my whole field before coming into this business. So, so I value communication a lot. You've taught me some of the early things that I needed to learn to be succinct and to the point um, about our messaging. And so um, what sticks out to me is that I think you talked about uh, people needing to know you and like you and trust you in order to buy your products and um, support what you're doing, whatever that is. You know, sometimes it's sales, but sometimes it's just um, helping people to understand why you're doing what you're doing. So. So our whole business has been a process from day one, convincing the community that, that the mill was a good idea, convincing uh, county officials to sell us our jail building, um, yeah. um, and then convincing customers that they should bake and try these grains or that it was safe to substitute these things for the white flour they had in their cupboards. So, so I recognize that knowing me knowing who we are as a business, liking what we're doing and trusting what we're doing is at the core of why people will engage with us. So um, on all of those levels, trying to be present, trying to be out front, saying yes to speaking engagements, yes to um, invitations, making sure that uh, we do what we say we're going to do, that we uh, under promise and over deliver and uh, sort of all of those things are important. Um, other tools that you you have shared early on in the process that I use all the time, uh, things like message mapping and making sure that I have my two clear sentences that I can say about everything we're doing because um, people are busy, they have short attention spans sometimes for new things and listening to what you're doing. So it's important to be clear and get your point out quickly. And so I, I do think I've embodied a lot of those principles and maybe some of it comes to me naturally as well. <laughs> yeah, I think you're I think you're giving me a lot of credit and thank you for that. You're but right. I think you've been a very good student. And you know, you mentioned message mapping and uh, in the show notes we'll include some samples of message maps, but in a message map you would have a key message at the center and that's something that you repeat over and over again, mm -hmm. especially in a media interview, because uh, you want to be sure that the journalist who's doing the interview 
gets that into the story in some way. So. Yeah. And when, you know, I recognized early on we were doing something exciting and quirky. We were renovating a jail in the center of our town. We were uh, exercising this business plan that was very different and um, doing something very different. So we really were in a position to have reporters, TV cameras showing up on our doorstep unannounced a lot. And so I really did feel like I needed to learn how to be prepared for impromptu interviews and be ready to speak off the cuff at any point. So um, that has taken a lot of practice. Yeah, yeah. I've had a lot of well, I'm glad you brought up the no like trust factor because I think it's one thing for people to know you and another for them to like you. That's good. But if, if especially if they're going to spend money with you online, they do have to trust that your website is legitimate and that you you know that actually if they put their credit card in, you're not going to like steal their credit card and you're actually going to be sending them. So yeah, there is a whole. Um, process there that humans have to go through in order to want to part with their money mm -hmm. and that is essentially uh, what the essence of a brand is and you talked about delivering on your brand promise and um, you know a, a brand is a promise whether it's you know me promising something to you as, mm -hmm. a, as a one human to another human mm -hmm. or an organization or company making a promise to its customers mm -hmm. And trust, I, I'm a firm believer, is built over time and sustained over time. And it, it um, building trust is, is infused in everything you do as a company. And doing what you say you're going to do consistently, um, that comes not just from me, but it comes from every representative of the company. So it's culture building inside the company as well. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, for you, hiring your first employee was probably a huge step. I remember mm -hmm. for me when I started my business 31 years ago, that first employee is almost like the hardest because you're really trusting that this human is going to be representing your brand mm -hmm. uh, with the customers and mm -hmm. the community. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, that's, a, that's another reason why it's so important to have a good training and orientation program when you hire new people. Yeah is they are a physical uh, representative of your brand. Yes, yes. And I, I would say that's 10 years in now, that's some of where my attention is going. I'm really inspired by uh, the Zingerman's family of businesses uh, that started out in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And as that business grew, it grew into a cluster of businesses that all interplay with one another. And um, as we grow, we need more tools for doing that training, training the story of the company, the, the origin story, right? Training uh, what our values are and um, how we want to express those values in everything we do. So, so we're spending a, a lot of time on that now as we mature into a larger company with 20 employees. Yeah. And the other thing that's so terrific is the way you bring all your raving fans together at the Needing Conference. Yes. I mean, that is another <laughs> brand building technique because you want all those people to say, I met you at the Needing mm -hmm. Conference. And then they all form these relationships amongst each other, uh, amongst themselves. And then other things will spawn from that. Yes. And I always say that's kind of like the essence of happiness in life, you know, these relationships both personal and professional, and then having a band of, of raving fans and yeah. brand, brand ambassadors yeah. out in the world. Yeah, and I honestly, I, I w could have never predicted the impact that the Needing Conference would have. You know, it started as com problem solving conversations uh, that we wanted to invite people to, not only to solve the issues of how do we spur Maine's grain economy, but how could these conversations inspire people in other places, and it sure has. It, it really has spawned other conferences um, and networks, uh, people who have formed grain alliances in their own region in order to stay connected. We are now interconnected globally with each other. So there's networks on the West Coast, in the center of our country, Phoenix, uh, Asheville, California, Washington State, but, um, but now internationally. There are international conferences that we attend uh, where we meet other small groups from Denmark and the UK and the country of Georgia and Estonia and um, and that's wonderful it's so fun <laughs> it's amazing and actually you recently went to the UK for a speaking engagement and this is something that you helped 
create a grain economy there. Can you talk about that? Well, we, uh, we brought over a keynote speaker to the Needing Conference in Maine several years ago, Kimberly Bell, because she runs a small bakery in Nottingham. And she was doing some of the most innovative baking um, from our perspective at that time, using grains from a wheat breeder and researcher, Martin Wolf. Martin pioneered uh, some research uh, in the field of agroforestry with grains. So he was actually trying to solve a barley mildew problem, um, but discovered after 35 years of research that he could resolve some of the barley mildew issues by planting windrows of barley in between windrows of forest and trees. Uh, and that breaks up pest and disease cycles. So um, in addition to that, he was also uh, working to build resilient populations of wheat seed and grain seed in the face of climate change. And he was doing that by blending different varieties all together in a seed mix that would be planted together, they grow together, and they get harvested um, all together. And so in the end, you have what's called a population wheat. You might have seven different varieties of wheat in what you just harvested. And that's very different. We, we're not seeing much of that in the US at all. And yet Kimberly was taking this population wheat and turning it into bread. And she was determined to work with whatever the specs were from that particular crop year and developing um, strategies for dealing with low protein or high protein or wheat that had started to sprout in the field or wheat that, you know, she was just figuring out the baking techniques that allowed her to use local wheat no matter what. So we brought her over to the Needing Conference as our keynote speaker. She was really inspired by our network, our conference, sort of the organization we had put into bringing people together. Uh, and developed a similar network over in the UK. So she's a few years in to hosting an event much like the Needing Conference in Nottingham, and I was asked to go over and speak at the conference. So it was great fun. I felt like I was transported back into our early years of the conference, um, but met a whole new network of folks over in Europe that are all starting to cooperate and work together. So it was it was wonderful. I enjoyed it. Yeah, I think it's remarkable. and. Again, I mean, a lot of people in your position wouldn't wouldn't take up an take an opportunity to do that because I'm sure you had a lot going on at home and a little bit of business and yeah, but you did it and yeah. uh, you not only did the the speaking engagement but you did a whole tour. Of yeah, the, the, and I you know I think one of the things that's important I learn every time I travel and what was what was important to them and me coming over is that every grain network every local grain network usually starts with a strength in some area you've got an inspired farmer or an inspired seed breeder um, and in maine we had uh, infrastructure to build a mill and we, we sort of figured that out early on um, they have not yet figured out the milling piece entirely so they have they're outsourcing milling um, the, the, the grain farmers don't quite yet have the cleaning machines they need to get things clean and dehauled. So their hope in bringing me over was to inspire uh, the milling piece and how did we overcome those issues and problems and obstacles in our grain economy. So hopefully it will have some impact and um, I think I discovered there will be opportunities to travel again to places like um, Germany and back to Denmark just to see the advancements and be of more help on the infrastructure side. So, well, I've traveled in Germany. I have relatives there, and um, they they would love you, and they would love the bread and having uh, ein Bier bitte yes, yes. <laughs> with some brat. Yes, <laughs> yes, so awesome. Yes. So uh, I admire you, and I uh, I envy these travels. So mm -hmm. good for you. So, well, we're going to continue with more from Amber in just a moment, but first I want to remind you about how you can get access to my latest book, which is called Grow Your Audience, Grow Your Brand. You can get that by going to prmaven.com slash giveaway and download a free copy. And now we're going to hear from Mike Duguay from Thomas College with a few words about the PR Maven. After reading PR Works, I really started to think about how marketing actually works. And I know that sounds a little bit ridiculous, but what I realize is what each platform nowadays that we use out there in digital media and social media has its own nuance and also quirks to it. And understanding how they're used is exceedingly important. Because when you have a hammer in your hand, everything looks like a nail. 
and you can't approach it that way in marketing. And that's where I think Nancy's brilliance really shined in, in PR works. I think Grow Your Audience, Grow Your Brand is, is really sort of the manifesto of understanding that there's many different levels to marketing. It's on your personal side of your brand, how actually you express yourself through business, but also what people hear you saying and what they see out there in the public eye as well. So I think what's really important there, that's really the blueprint of how you go about using these new social media platforms, but also to express who you are as a human being. Because people want to see you authentically and genuinely working with what not only what you do, but also with the customers. And Nancy, on a personal level, I think she just, she, that's who she is. She embodies that approach. Welcome back to the PR Maven podcast. And we're here with Amber Lamke from Main Grains. And the Main Grains is celebrating its 10th anniversary. And Amber, tell us about the plans for celebrating your anniversary. Well, we're excited, and I, I'm, I'm glad that we're spending uh, some time this year to sort of pause and reflect and celebrate. Uh, I have the help of my sales and marketing director, Kayla Bess, uh, to plan some festivities. A Thomas College graduate. A Thomas <laughs> College graduate from Maine. And um, we have a couple of events coming up. We'll be doing uh, a press release and um, some tours on September 7th, but uh, hosting a big community celebration on Saturday, September 10th right at the grist mill outside where we had our initial launch. Uh, in fact, we're gonna be inviting the same band that played for our uh, launch celebration for our 10 year celebration. Um, and uh, as an aside, this band uh, plays fiddle and guitar and you know, very uplifting and fun, Glenn Loper and Steve Muse and uh, their team. From Farmington. From Farmington and uh, Glenn Loper uh, is someone that I first met Contra dancing in my 20s when I was young and uh, out visiting Grange Halls all over Maine to dance. Uh, it's actually how I met my husband uh, at the North Whitefield uh, Contra dance. And, uh, and I was in a group living situation for a while when I was single in Portland and Glenn had the room next door to me in this house that we all shared. And he'd be practicing his, his mandolin playing every single night, it was so wonderful. Um, so Glenn played at our wedding and then later played at our launch for Main Grains, and I'm so excited that he was available to come back and play for the 10-year anniversary. Oh, that's awesome. So, great music, there's going to be great food, there's going to be grain demonstrations, pasta making. Uh, it happens to be coinciding with the Skowhegan Farmers Market, which is full and festive and fun in the summer every Saturday. So, it'll be a good reason to make Skowhegan a destination on Saturday, September 10th. I think we need to write a main grain song. There needs to be. <laughs> <laughs> Kayla, Kayla, you're in the back room. Let's work. Let's put that on the to-do list. She's saying thumbs up. I think I know someone who can do that. Actually, we'll talk later. Really, yeah. that would be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you have a twin sister and I just love that this is happening she decided to create a company called The Good Crust and she recently won a competition can you tell us about her and her company and the competitions that she won yes yes um, my twin's name is Heather Heather Kerner Kerner's our maiden name um, she lives nearby in Canaan, Maine and she started dabbling early on with our grains in her role as an occupational therapist at the Messalonsky School District. She's an, in an OT program. She worked with uh, functional life students and special ed students on a business plan inside their programming at school to make products that they would plan, prepare, package, sell, deliver, collect the money, um, spend the money in a school store. You know, she basically was running this little business inside uh, the special ed department and was using our flour to make things like donuts and pizza dough and things like that and really realized that the hands-on experience um, for kids is just invaluable and um, she perfected a great pizza dough and decided you know what there is room for this in the marketplace in Maine and beyond no one in the state of Maine was using a hundred percent Maine grains in a pizza dough product to make pizza. Pizza is America's favorite flatbread and it is an economical, shareable meal with families. So she really saw this as an opportunity for Maine. Um, so right now, 
she is straddling life between launching the good crust um, and reducing her hours in a, as an occupational therapist. She's using the business as a first job and training experience for students who graduate out of high school um, but are, are, uh, don't yet have their first job and may need a job that offers a little more structure to um, use their unique talents um, but also address their needs in the workplace. So the Good Crust is now, we launched their business inside our commercial kitchen at Main Grains and the Miller's Table. She got started, bought her own building in Canaan, got set up uh, out there and just recently launched operations and production out at the Canaan facility. She has been uh, just on fire uh, joining all of these uh, accelerator programs and women's business uh, joined a program at the Women's Business Center with CEI and most recently won $10,000 in Greenlight Maine's pitch competition. Um, right now, any grant funds she gets are going into equipment and freezer space and all that it requires to run uh, a frozen product business. So she's excited and she's, she's well launched. We use the pizza dough at Main Grains at the Miller's Table uh, where we make wood-fired pizza to feature the grains on the menu alongside other baked goods and breads. Uh, folks like Flight Deck Brewing have been early adopters and we're even developing some new marketing around the pizza dough and the idea of a main pizza because pizza's tough. P uh, customers come to you and say, well, what's it like? Is it is it Neapolitan or is it New York style pizza or is it, you know, is it deep dish pizza? And she's had to say, no, no, it's not that, it's not that. It's it's Maine, Maine pizza. pizza. <laughs> so, so we just did some marketing uh, to define what is Maine craft pizza, right? And Maine craft pizza uses local grains. It's dough made in Maine. It has toppings that come from local sources. It uses cheese maybe from pl places like Crooked Face Creamery or other creameries from Maine. Um, and maybe it's even made uh, in a wood-fired oven that, you know, burns Maine sustainable, uh, you know, timber resource. So it. anyway, uh, we're, we're, we're defining our own pizza, but she's often launched and folks should definitely look for her product, read more about her business at thegoodcrust.com. It's Heather Kerner. We are identical. Her hair's a little bit longer. Yeah, you guys are. <laughs> and she is as articulate and well-spoken as you are. And I love that. And mm -hmm. Kudos to your parents. Yeah. <laughs> I'll tell them. But um, yeah, I mean, people can actually visit the Miller's Table and Main Grains. There's a retail shop, and Crooked Face Creamery is right there where you can buy wonderful cheeses made by uh, my friend, our friend, Amy Robot. Yes. So there is actually a, a physical location where you can go and, and see everything in action. But also, your products are in Hannaford's supermarkets and yes main grains products are distributed throughout the northeast and you can find them in most natural food stores we work with about 15 plus distributors now that help get it around the northeast so ask for the products Hannaford has picked up three of our SKUs the pastry flour spelt flour and an all-purpose baking flour that are now available in over 170 stores in the northeast um, Whole Foods carries our organic oats, so it's it's becoming easier to find in, in everyday grocery stores, and you can also visit our website just to see where to find. And you can also order online. And, and have, you can order online. Yeah. Yeah. Now, um, you have a very famous customer for your oats. <laughs> Should we mention Martha? that? <laughs> yeah. A woman named Martha, a very yeah. tall woman named yeah. Martha. Yeah. 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 Um, I, I had the privilege a few years ago of being on the Martha Bakes show. And Martha, We're talking about Martha. Martha Stewart. Martha Stewart, the, the Martha. Uh, she asked that I come down and be a part of helping to educate on an oat episode. And so I got to meet her then, and she became a connoisseur of our cracked oats at that time. So we make rolled oats, which is like an old-fashioned flaked oat. And then in our processing, some of those whole oat kernel, kernels get cracked. We separate those out. They are about the size of a steel cut oat, so you cook them a little bit longer, but they have a little more body and texture to them. And so we sell them as cracked oats because we're not really steel cutting them. We don't have a steel cutting machine. Um, and she loves the cracked oats. So she has called out the cracked oats uh, on the Dr. Oz show, on her Instagram feed, uh, in lots of places. And 
um, the oats are now being sold on Martha.com, her new retail platform. So I, I imagine we'll do some more partnering with Martha over the years. But yes, she is she is a big fan of the craft. Talk oats. about a brand ambassador. Yes, yes. <laughs> That's about the yes. best brand ambassador you could get. Yes. Yes. That's awesome. So do you have some advice for other entrepreneurs on how they can best use PR and personal branding to grow their businesses? Great question. I, you know, I think dedicating, there, there's so much to think about when you're starting a business. It's easy to get mired in all the day-to-day -day details, but remembering that people are curious. They want, they want to see and hear content from you. They want updates. Uh, so dedicating a part of your day and a part of your brain to uh, what's the story I can share about what we're doing today? What's, this, what's the fun story I could share about my staff today? Because they have lives that are interesting and they're contributing to the business um, in wonderful ways. So, so there's stories to tell all the time. And, and I'll give you an example. I learned when I was on vacation last week and my kids had the house to themselves that my son decided to invite one of his best pals over to cook and to use the kitchen uh, while they had it all to themselves. And I, and I said, well, what did you cook? And he said, well, I picked a salad from the garden and my friend Jakub, whose family is originally um, from Slovakia, made cherry dumplings. <laughs> and I said, like, well, tell me more about the cherry dumplings. And, you know, well, they used our flour, this, the, the all-purpose flour at home and picked cherries from the tree, which are available right now. He grew up on plum dumplings and cooked potato and shredded the potato to add to a dough. Wow. Stuffed it with cherries, <laughs> served it with crispy breadcrumbs. And it was amazing. I was, I was floored to hear that um, this, this all just came about for fun in the kitchen Did from a high school Instagram student. Did they take Instagram photos? I so don't. Kayla and I uh, interviewed Jakub yesterday about these dumplings because it turns out he had never made them. He'd only ever watched his mother and family members make them, but left on his own in a kitchen with resources to, to try it out himself. He made dumplings. So anyway, I, I think that's so fun, right? And it, it inspires other people to try, try and experiment in the kitchen. Um, I just finished reading a cookbook called Summer Kitchens that I learned about in the UK when I was over there. I attended a workshop um, from a Ukrainian chef, uh, by a woman by the name of Olia, and she had just finished the Summer Kitchens cookbook. Well, it's a book all about um, the outdoor kitchens of Ukrainian families, and it's where they process the harvest. It's where they cook and keep the heat outside the house. Um, and she did a demo on how to whip up dumplings stuffed with sauerkraut that just inspired me. It really is, it can be easy. Cooking at home can be easy and fast. It doesn't need to be complicated. So anyway, these are all stories that are fun. They show how to use the product and I think they can inspire people. So if you're starting your own business, really tell the stories of what's going on. Um, give tours, try to capture some of that in, in picture and video if you can. Uh, I've tried to encourage my employees to tell their stories. So it doesn't always need to be my story about the business. Um, other, my employees have come to the business with different backgrounds and different ways that they're inspired. And that's an important thing to tell too. So um, it's all brand building, right? It exactly. all comes back to knowing you and liking you and trusting you. Exactly, yeah, that's great advice. Thank you for sharing. And you just mentioned a book, The Summer Kitchen. Is there another book, a podcast, or an app that has been helpful to you, and why? Yes, I, I mean, I would recommend different things to different people. In my own free time, I read cookbooks. Uh, in, my, in my early entrepreneurship, a formative book for me was one that was recommended by my business counselor from the Small Business Development Center. It's called The E-Myth. A lot of people have read it if you're starting a business, but um, ultimately stands for the entrepreneur's myth, uh, but was a good foundation to think about as you build your business, keep in mind that you are going to wear a ton of hats as an entrepreneur. You can't keep all those hats forever. You, have, you need to build your business with, operation, with operationalizing in mind. How do I operationalize this task that I do today? that I may not do a year from now. Um, so building systems so that it doesn't all live on your shoulders forever is really important. Um, the E-Myth talks about 
McDonald's being the ultimate example of that? I mean, how do you franchise a restaurant that does the same thing and puts out the same product all over the world? You do that by operationalizing each and every step. So, um, so that was a helpful book uh, for me in my early stages. Um, or app or podcast. I, I would say uh, we use tons of apps uh, at work, but one of my favorite and one that I'm in every single day is a customer relations management app. And for a small business like mine, some of the CRM software out there is much too big. So we found an app called the less annoying CRM. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> and it was affordable. It, it's $10 uh, per month per user. So very affordable, but it's a way that we keep track of our customer relations and conversations and um, and can schedule follow-ups with folks and, and really keep a record of all of our contacts and touches with, with customers. So that's, that's one great. of my favorites. That's yeah. great. Well, I'm glad you brought up the e-myth too, because that was particularly impactful for me and my business also. And just thinking about, you know, how a lot of us get into a certain business. I got into a PR agency because I liked doing PR, but when you're actually running a business, a lot of times you're not actually doing the thing, you know, you, at a lot of points in my career, I haven't actually been doing PR. I've been, you know, managing the checking account and getting loans and hiring people and you know it's not really PR it's um, it could be any kind of right. business so uh, I do like the idea of you know if I were to be starting a franchise and there was going to be a Marshall communications in every city across the country could I hand them an operations manual that would describe all the steps from opening up to closing at the end of the day and and also, again, that gets into branding as well because it, how you run your business is your brand as well. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times doing things consistently, how you answer the phone and your email signatures and everything, the look and feel of everything to do with the business, if it's consistent, mm -hmm. then, then people will recognize it. And that's part of the know and like trust mm -hmm. funnel as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So Amber, how can people get in touch with you and how can they order Maine Grains products? Uh, great question. You can go to maingrains.com uh, on our website. We're also on Instagram and Facebook under um, the hashtag Maine Grains. You can come visit us in Skowhegan. We're right downtown, uh, right behind Heights Chevrolet, right in the historic district. So we're at 42 Court Street. We do offer free tours that are, the dates are listed on our website. You can visit the dry goods shop where you can buy our grains six days a week. You can visit the Miller's Table Cafe right in our building Have six a days a week, Monday a through pizza. Saturday. Um, Saturdays are a really fun day to come up because you would also get to see the farmer's market and the creamery is open and um, there's live music at the farmer's market. So if you're trying to make a day of it, uh, Saturday's a great day to come. Uh, you can email me, amber at maingrains.com um, and we welcome you to be in touch. Great. Well, Amber, this has been really fun and uh, a little bit of, you know, it's been a significant part of my career uh, to work with you and I've really enjoyed knowing you. I'm so glad. I think it was Warren Cook actually who brought us together, um, a mentor of mine and, and yours, I believe. Back a lot in, of gratitude to Warren. Yes. yes. <laughs> I'll have to give him a shout out. So thanks for joining us everyone in PR Maven Nation and I hope you have a great day. Thanks, Nancy. Thanks for listening to this episode of the PR Maven podcast. I invite you to share a review of the podcast on iTunes or your favorite podcast player. Be sure to subscribe to our podcast so you never miss an episode. You can also join the PR Maven Nation on Facebook. It's free to join and it's a great community of like-minded individuals who are all looking to learn and grow from one another. If you use an Alexa device, use your Alexa app to search the skills and games section to find Find and enable the PR Maven podcast flash briefing. This will give you access to exclusive content and more PR and marketing advice. Thanks again for listening and have a great rest of your week, PR Maven Nation.